We're in the middle of winter here in Ohio. It's so cold outside, but we have our pellet stove running inside, so it's nice and toasty. My sourdough bread rises so well in here when we have our stove going. So I've been making tons of bread. Today, I wanna show you exactly how I make my simple sourdough bread. We also wanna talk about how we're handling these long winter days, and then Cody wants to try something completely new and fun this afternoon. I've had to add in a few extra steps around here to fight the cold. Milker doesn't work right when it's this cold outside. It's like eight degrees out there right now. The animal's water freezes really fast. And in general, I just have to do what I can to make the animals comfortable. Even though I really don't like this cold weather and it makes things harder around here, there is something about the challenge of winter that it does feel good when you know you're doing a good job taking care of everything. It's a little bit like running. It's not very fun sometimes when you're doing it, but afterwards it does feel really good. So cold out there. We got some more snow last night. Not a lot on the ground, probably just an inch or two. This hose right here for the air for the milker has to be brought in or it is super stiff if it's left outside. <laughs> good morning, cowboy. Hey, Maddie. I'm coming. Oh, this hose is already getting stiff. I have been giving Maddie some extra grain right now to give her some more calories to help warm her up. Come on, girl. This hot water bottle here has to be on top of this pulsator or it like really slows down when it gets cold. The milker pump back there itself also doesn't work if it's really cold, so I'll show you what I've got back there. I've got the pump surrounded by insulation, and then inside here, there's a heater to keep it warm during the night. I don't have to have it on during the day. I just turn it on at night so that in the morning then, everything in here is a little warmer because when it gets so cold, it just doesn't even work. The heater that I've got in here is, it's like a chicken coop heater, I guess. I don't feel like I would want to use any kind of heater in a chicken coop, but that's what it was labeled for. So I felt like it'd be pretty safe to have in here in the barn to keep this warm. Hey girl, it's okay. It's okay. I have found that if a calf is left to be on its mama, they just get skittish. They don't want you to mess with them. So I've been coming out here and tying her up every morning while Maddie is being milked. That's calmed her down a lot and then I'll pet her for a bit and she's getting used to it so that when, like the first time I came in here to do that, she was just running around all over the place and stuff. So she's really calmed down. And this is to train her to be a future family milk cow. Good girl. She's a little extra skittish this morning, I think because of the camera. Cows really are designed to be able to withstand the harsh weather but they do need a little bit of help from us to really thrive. And basically they really just need something to get out of the wind, out of like rain and snow. And then they need some good, fresh, dry bedding. And if they have that, they really will be comfortable. Frozen stiff. I make sure this is cleaned out every morning, put dry bedding down. They've got this roof to get out of the rain or snow. Right now it's definitely not in rain. And I've been keeping Holly in this stall over here at night because I'm separating her so I get all the milk in the morning. And then during the day, I'll open this thing back up so they both have access to this all day long. When I was hand milking, my pinkies would get so cold because they weren't on the teats. It is nice to be able to use gloves most of the time right now while she's being milked. I got these plugs because different quarters get done at different times and it was a real pain to try to keep them kinked off so that they weren't just sucking in air when it was done. Good girl. A lot of milk in here. It's snowing a little bit again. This is an old milking system. One thing that I really love about it is that I don't have to use chemicals to run through the lines to clean it out. The lines that the milk goes through is only this long. And so I can use this brush here to clean it out really good with some soap and hot water. And it's very clean. I'm very picky about my milking equipment being very clean, but I'm not like OCD about it and like, 
super worried about everything being for sure sterile and everything like that. And then every once in a while, I will also take everything apart here and clean it really well. We're getting a lot of milk right now. It's usually between three and four gallons. I guess it kind of depends on how much the calf got. Michelle is making a ton of butter. Now I was thinking about starting my first batch of hard cheese today, but I don't have all of the supplies I need. So actually going to be doing something else this afternoon that I think is going to be a lot of fun, something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Michelle is also going to show you how to make some really delicious ricotta cheese. Looks like we've got even less than three gallons this morning. That uh, doesn't happen very often, but I think this cold is just making so she's not producing quite as much. While Cody's out finishing his chores, I'm getting the kids breakfast and tearing out papers for homeschool. My sourdough starter hasn't quite finished fermenting yet, so I'll get to the bread then once I'm done with homeschool. Obviously, it's also very important that they've got plenty of food and water while it's this cold. They need to have access to hay all the time. Like I said, I'm giving the cow a little extra grain right now too at milking but they need to keep those calories up to keep them warm. I finally got myself a hay ring. This thing is great. I had a round bale in there. She just finished it off yesterday. I'm getting another one today, but I've got a couple square bales here that I'm gonna have to feed her until I get that other round bale in here. You could almost kind of get the idea that if it's so cold, she's not gonna drink much water, but she still does drink a lot of water. And obviously right now without a heated waterer, it freezes. I haven't gotten a heated water yet because they're expensive and also just a thing of kind of a fire hazard out here, keeping it plugged in and everything. But this actually works really good to have a smaller water thing like this that usually about once a day I have to break the ice on top and then by evening the whole thing is maybe frozen. So then I'll bring it out here and break the ice out of it and fill it up again. I'm not sure why, but my mic stopped working for this entire next part. The chickens also do pretty well in the cold. Usually when it stays up close to 32 degrees, we don't have much issue with the water freezing since the hoop house traps in sunlight and stays a little warmer. We had a heated waterer, but it stopped working. So Izzy has been putting their water into a pan every day and breaking the ice. I do have a heated waterer on order though that should be here tomorrow. What I used to do when we had a lot more chickens was just have double the amount of waterers and thaw the frozen ones to replace the others and it really wasn't that bad. About the most annoying thing to deal with is the frozen eggs. Tears has to get out there to gather them before too late or they're all frozen. The most important thing for chickens, just like cows, is to have a space out of the wind and dry bedding. This hoop house is perfect. It warms up with the sunshine and the deep bedding on the floor is also providing a little heat because of the composting process. I think I have noticed though that I think when we had more chickens in here it stayed a little warmer because of their body heat. Oh well. I am ready to mix up my dough and just a disclaimer here guys, I am not an expert with sourdough. I do not claim to be an expert, nothing like that. People have been asking me so many questions about my bread and so today I'm going to show you guys what I do. I break some rules, I speed things up. What I'm shooting for is just a good old everyday sourdough loaf. My family loves it so I'm happy. To mix this bread, I just put all the ingredients into the bowl at one time mix them up and put them in a bowl for the first rise. And yes, I put the salt in right away. I've watched different videos. Some people swear that it makes a huge difference to add the salt in later. I've tried it both ways. We can't tell a difference. And so I just put everything in right away because historically I have forgotten to put salt in and bread without salt is disgusting. So you want your starter to have doubled in size after it doubles it starts to deflate. You want to catch it like right after it doubles. You don't want to use it like after it's deflated. It should float when you put it on top of water. That means it has lots of air bubbles in it. So in this bowl right now, I have 670 grams of warm water. I think warm water just helps to accelerate the rising process. So 670 grams of warm water, 22 grams of salt, and 186 grams of starter. And then I'm just gonna add my flour in here. I've been using whole grain spelt flour for quite some time now. And just recently I ran out and so I grabbed some whole wheat flour from the grocery store and I actually like the end result a lot better than the spelt. I'm not saying that I won't go back to spelt, 
but basically the whole wheat flour makes a lot softer of a loaf, not quite as dense and crumbly. I usually do about half and half. You can do whatever ratio of flours you want, just as long as you come up to 932 grams of flour, you can just swap it up. I'm using organic bread flour today, as well as whole wheat organic King Arthur's flour. I really feel like bread flour gives this loaf extra oomph like for it to rise. It also gives it more stretch than just normal all-purpose, but all-purpose works great too. You can also make this loaf with 100% whole wheat. It absolutely works. You'll have a bit of a denser loaf. It's gonna be a little bit more crumbly and it'll dry out a little bit faster, but it's still delicious. You do not have to use a mixer for this portion. Like, I'm not actually going to be developing the gluten in this first mix. I just think this is so much faster and, and I don't like to get gunk underneath my fingernails. Ooh, it drives me crazy. Here you can see this is a very wet, sticky dough. I promise it will come together beautifully. Do not over mix this. All that you want is for the ingredients to be just incorporated. And then I just dump it into a greased glass bowl and let it sit for 30 minutes before I do anything with it. Lately, I have replaced Pam cooking spray with this avocado oil spray from Thrive Market. We have a link in the description box if you wanna check out Thrive Market. I really like to use a glass bowl with a lid because if you just put a tea towel or something like that over top of the bread while it's rising, the bread can kind of get a skin on it and I personally just find that really annoying. I'm gonna let this rest for 30 minutes and then I'm going to do my first stretch and fold and all together, I'm going to do four stretches and folds 20 minutes apart. It's very simple, it sounds complicated. It's the easiest thing in the world, I'll show you. If you are wanting to start making sourdough bread, one of my best pieces of advice is just go and get yourself a starter that's already strong rather than making yourself one. You can definitely make your own if you feel like it. I mean, it's a great experience. I made my first sourdough starter on my own and honestly, it just did not work very well. I mean, it just struggled to rise a loaf of bread. I struggled to get it to double well. I followed all the instructions and it was a starter. It just wasn't a strong one. One of my friends came to the rescue and just let me borrow some of hers and my mind was just completely blown. She had a strong starter that had been going for years. And I mean, it just like, the bread just went poof effortlessly. <laughs> and so you can get sourdough starters that are already strong. You can get them on Etsy. Um, if you have a friend who's successful with sourdough bread, it's just so much easier. I got really discouraged with my sourdough starter and I was like ready to quit. I was just like, this is too hard. But once I got the strong starter, I was like, oh wow, this is so easy. And now sourdough bread is the easiest thing in the world. I'm actually thinking of teaching my nine-year-old how to do it. That is how simple it is. So while I am waiting for this bread to be ready for its first stretch and fold, I am going to make some ricotta cheese. I've been making tons and tons of butter lately. And I just decided I'm going to make some cheese instead to break up some of the monotony. These long days in January can get long <laughs> so anyways this is the book that i'm using cheese making by ricky carroll i really like this book i haven't made like tons of things in this book but i really enjoy how she explains all the different processes she explains all the different ingredients and like how to cut the curd all about the different cultures and things so this is a very valuable book i am going to make her whole milk ricotta today this recipe is a very very good place for beginners to start making cheese. It's extremely simple. I used to make this recipe with skim milk and the resulting cheese was very dry. And I quickly realized that you definitely want a lot of cream in this cheese because it'll make much softer of a curd. I'm gonna replace a little bit of the skim milk with some cream because our milk isn't very creamy right now. And if you've missed us talking about it before, the reason we don't have a lot of cream on our milk right now, I mean, it should because we have a Guernsey cow known for lots of good cream, but the calf is drinking from the cow right now. And when it does, that cow can hold back the cream for the calf. So once we wean the calf, then we should be getting more cream again. I'm just gonna start here by dissolving two teaspoons of citric acid in half a cup of water. And I'm gonna be adding this to the cold milk. I want it to dissolve in the cold milk before I turn the heat on.
I'm also going to add two teaspoons of salt to this milk before I turn it on. I like to go pretty generous with the salt. I like to heat this milk kind of around medium. You don't want to do it on high heat or the bottom will scorch really bad. Okay, my bread is ready for its first stretch and fold. But before I do that, I miss telling you guys that I don't keep my starter out on the counter and babysit it like some people are afraid they have to do. You really don't have to do that. I just stick it right back in the fridge and pull it out the next time I wanna make bread. Before I do a stretch and fold, I just like to make my hands wet. That way the bread dough doesn't stick to my hands. I just take the dough like this and pull it up. And I do this about six times. Just pull it up and fold it over. And you'll see how it gets tighter and tighter each time. Okay, there's one stretch and fold done. And now I'm gonna set my timer for 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, I'll do another stretch and fold, and then I'll set my timer again, another stretch and fold, timer again, another stretch and fold. The stretch and folds don't have to be like down to the minute. If you happen to forget it for an hour or something, it's totally fine. Basically just aim to have four stretch and folds within the first rising period of your bread. This bread will probably take, I'm gonna say, five hours in our toasty house to double, and you don't want it to more than double. If you let your bread overprove, it won't rise very nicely in the oven. I like to stir the ricotta as it's heating just every now and then. It doesn't have to be often, just a few times to keep anything from sticking to the bottom. This pan also has a really thick bottom, which makes so that the milk doesn't scorch as badly. So it's really nice to have a pan with a nice thick bottom. Our bread is ready for its next stretch and fold. You can see here how it's much more elasticy than it was the first time. My candy thermometer broke this week, so I'm eyeballing this. This is a really easy cheese to eyeball because once it's ready, the curd will start to separate from the whey. There have been times in the past where I've made this recipe and the curd didn't separate very well. If that happens to you, just add a little bit more acid, just a tiny little bit, and usually that'll push it right over the edge. This cheese is supposed to be heated to 195. So if your cheese is at 195 and it's not separating, you know that you should add just a tiny little bit more acid. You can see here on the spoon how it's just starting to separate. You do not want to boil your cheese. If you boil this, your cheese will be very dry. Once the curd has separated, you just take your pot off and put a lid on it and let it set for 10 minutes. After the cheese has set for 10 minutes, I just line a colander with a cheesecloth. If you wanna save your whey, just put a bowl underneath, but keep in mind that this whey is going to be acidic because it has the citric acid in it. In my experience, you do not wanna put that on your plants. You will kill off your plants. I have done it. This cheese has been sitting here for 10 minutes and I'm just gently scraping this cheese off the bottom, being very gentle with it. I'm gonna pour it into a cheesecloth and hang it for 20 minutes. You don't want to hang this cheese for more than 20 to 30 minutes because you don't want it to dry out too much. I really like my ricotta to be nice and soft, not dry and crumbly. Don't say anything, Cody. I do this every time, okay? Just like that. The faucet's fine. Stretch and fold number three. You can tell the bread is really starting to rise. It has nice big air bubbles in it. What you don't want to do is knead the bread. You just want to stretch it and fold it over. Whoop. This cheese has been hanging now for 20 minutes, so I'm just going to take it and put it into a bowl over here. I like to break it up a little bit, and then depending on the texture, I like to add in just a little bit of cream. You can also add olive oil or whatever you like. I'm gonna do some salt and some Italian seasonings because this is going to go into a lasagna tonight. Even though I added some salt to this cheese before, I almost always add salt as well afterwards. Here's some dried basil from our garden last year. I'm also gonna add in a little bit of onion salt. This gives some really nice flavor. And then just a little bit of cream. I like it to be nice and creamy for a lasagna, kind of like cottage cheese. Mm -hmm. 
this cheese is done now, I'm just gonna set it in the fridge until I'm ready to put the lasagna together tonight. I'm gonna stretch and fold this bread one more time and then set it in on the stove to finish out the rise. I'm only going to let this double. I don't want it to more than double or the bread will be flat when you bake it, I have found. Just FYI, this pellet stove is not like a cook stove on top. It's just nice and warm around here, so I'm not like baking the bread when I set it on here. This will be my cure for the winter blues. I am finally getting around to making mead. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I want to be able to do it with the honey that I get from my bees, but uh, I didn't want to start with that. A couple of reasons. Number one, because we ran out of that honey. And number two, I didn't want to waste it if it doesn't turn out right. So I'm using some store-bought raw honey for this. There's some raisins going in here, some orange peels. I am getting all of my information on how to make this from a YouTube video that I found. The channel is City Steading Brews. The video is called How to Make Mead at Home. Everything you need to make your first mead. And they really did just make it very simple using these couple ingredients here, some bread yeast, and just some very simple... Um, I can't think of the word. Things. Most of the things that you have around. I did buy a couple extra things that they recommended. Things that you wouldn't have to have but might make it a little easier. So I'm going to do that. And we're going to be using bread yeast for this. And he said that's very controversial and stuff. But it's something that will definitely work. Especially just kind of to get your feet wet. As Michelle said with her bread that she's not an expert. I am very much even less of an expert with this mead stuff here. So don't take anything off of me. Go look it up yourself. I just want to show you what I'm doing. I really want to be working on some things outside. I really want to be building my office and I'm not going to do that in this kind of weather. Unfortunately, I won't be able to give the results in this video because I've got to let it sit for like a month or month and a half or so. I'm going to be putting three pounds of honey in here. Everything here has also been washed and sanitized, just FYI. If you have any issues with how I'm doing this, don't come to me. This is just for fun and I'm just following instructions and just trying to do something simple and we'll see how it turns out. Now the tea needs to go in. This is some black tea. I think it's basically to add some tannins. Next, we're gonna add about half of the water and shake it up. Tipping the Berkey. If you know, you know. Now my yeast is going in there and then we're about done. We're just gonna swirl it around a little bit. Now I'm gonna put this airlock on top and then we are done for now. Nothing else to do. I have to check back on it every once in a while and wait for about six weeks or so, like I said, and we'll see how it turns out. So while Cody is inside cleaning up his mead mess, I am gonna go on a walk. This is something I do every single day. At least I try every single day. I'm very gracious with myself if there's a day that I can't make it happen. But this is like one of the number one ways that I manage <laughs> to make it through the winter. In the past, I have really struggled with depression in the winter, especially January and February. And so this year, I am intentionally getting out every single day and it has made a huge, huge difference. I also really try to get my kids to go outside every single day, which is actually hard, especially with toddlers, but it is so incredibly worth it. They sleep so much better and they're just happier. It's gonna be a really cold, windy walk, but still, I feel like a million bucks when I get back and I don't enjoy cooking very much, so the evenings always look a little bit big to me when supper time rolls around and this way, I don't know, I just have fresh energy when I get back. I'm back from my walk and I'm gonna make some lasagna now. I'm just gonna fry up a bunch of ground beef. This is grass-fed beef from our heifer that we butchered a couple months ago. Whoa. She's coming. And then I'm gonna layer the ground beef and the ricotta cheese that I made and marinara sauce that I made this summer from our garden with lasagna noodles. I don't even boil these noodles. I just lay them right in the sauce and they soften up beautifully in the oven. This is one of my like really fast meals that I make if I'm in a hurry. Today we were shooting all day and so lasagna it is. 
14 degrees out here. I don't know what Michelle told you about her walking, but for me, running every day, it really honestly changed my life. I lost like 27 pounds last year and a lot of it had to do with getting into running. I was also struggling with some depression stuff and it really helped with that. I quit running for a little while after I did my long trail run with my sister and I got back in running now. I actually made a commitment to run at least one mile every day. I started towards the end of December and my first goal is to get to the end of January, see how I feel and then hopefully do it for the next year. And I'm feeling really good about it right now. I've had to run in a snowstorm. I've had to run at night, but it's been really worth it so far. So right now I'm probably gonna go do, I don't know, maybe a mile and a half, two miles or so. So of course I don't have as many noodles as I thought I had, but it'll still be enough. I like to put sauce down first, just to make so that the noodles are against something with liquid. And then I just layer everything up. This ricotta cheese turned out so good today. I added extra cream. And so it's like really soft yet crumbly. It is so good. Is it yummy, Eden? Yeah. We need to get outside of whatever stress you're in and just go do something. And for me, running has done that. It's helped me to just have a time and a place to be able to just go, get away from the stress, and just think or just be. It's so cold out here. I'm just gonna feel good when I'm done. And I think that's really important for anybody because any time of the year, us homesteaders get so stressed out with all the things we have to do. But especially in the winter, and especially in a place like Ohio where it's gray a lot and you get stuck inside a lot. There's not a lot of projects going on outside. And I get out every morning to milk the cow and stuff, but it's not quite the same. And I feel like I need to get out more than just that. Oh, it's cold out here. Got the lasagna done? Yup. Michelle had a massive nosebleed. She's still dealing with that. And the lasagna kind of got forgotten. So it's definitely done. We might just have to not eat the top of that. But I also need to get those green beans made and get some supper into the kids. Eh, it's just the top that's burnt. This will still taste good. All the green beans needed was a little bit of heat and butter and they're good to go. And of course we all know that this is way better than if they were frozen, right? Michelle's not here to defend herself. Real Salt saw a reel that Michelle did on Instagram and she mentioned Real Salt in there. They were happy that we did that. And so they sent us a box of some salt stuff. They sent some smoked salt. It is so good. I've been putting it on like everything. Let's see if I can get under this burnt cheese here. <laughs> That's delicious. I wasn't able to explain my process here because my nose was stuffed full of tissues. I had the worst nosebleed of my life. It was so bad that I was worried we'd have to go to the ER, but I did finally manage to get it stopped. I think my nose is just rebelling against the cold and also the dry air in our house from our pellet stove. But anyways, my bread is finally doubled. I lightly floured the counter you don't want to put too much flour on the counter or your dough won't stick together at all when you're trying to shape it after you've shaped your loaf you want to create surface tension so that the bread holds its shape in the oven this was a game changer for me since i've started doing this my loaves hold their shape so much better while proving in the fridge and then also while baking in the oven you just pull the ball of dough towards yourself a few times until the top is really taut I let the loaves rest for a minute or two while I flour both of the baskets. Don't skip this step. I've had bread dough stick to the fabric before and it basically ruined the loaves because the air bubbles all deflated while I was trying to unstick the dough from the cloth. I like to shape the dough and create surface tension one more time then before plopping the dough balls upside down into the basket seam side up. If the seam is coming apart, which can actually be a sign of too much flour on your counter, you can just pinch it shut. Flour the top of the loaf and then flip the cloth up on both sides and slip it into a plastic bag here again if you don't seal off the air and then the dough will form a crust which is not cool i pop these in the fridge overnight and usually i bake them then the next morning so it's actually the next evening. It's around 4.30 and I spent the day making a birthday cake for my mom. And so I didn't get my bread baked until now, but that's the cool thing about sourdough is you can just put it in the refrigerator and it will pretty much stop the fermentation. So the bread is totally fine. You can do this up to a few days. I have two Dutch ovens in the oven and they have been preheating at 425 for 30 minutes. You wanna let them preheat for at least 30 minutes before you pop the bread in. 
I got a bread lame to score my bread with. I tried a razor blade and it really just did not work. This is a very good investment for sourdough bread. I'm gonna bake these loaves at 425 for 20 minutes with the lid on, and then I take the lid off and bake them for another 20 minutes. My 20 minute timer just went, so I'm going to take the lid off of these things. And now another 20 minutes and they will be done. And it is looking lovely. Oh man, let's try again. Even though it's cold, this is nothing compared to the snowstorm we had last year. We had below negative 30 degree wind chills and there was snow everywhere. You'll really get a good idea of how we deal with the cold weather on the homestead if you watch that video next.